or seven years, it is my happy privilege to be associated with him in this camp. Uh, myself, as a member of the staff, he coming in as time permitted and uh, telling us about the camp of former years and uh, taking boys and the girls from the neighboring camp below us on nature walks, but a great, great spirit. For it was L. E. Buell who founded this camp in 1904. And this is the story that, as, as we have <coughs> gleaned it from him and from many others along the way. It seems as though in 1903, when the YMCA has one of its many annual conferences, Mr. Buell, then the State Secretary for the YMCA, much as Mr. Les, who many of you know is tonight, went to a meeting at Silver Bay, meeting of YMCA men, and at this meeting, they commenced to talk about a new thing that was emerging across the country called camping. A new thing, a new kind of a program, a new kind of a venture, camping. For somebody back in 1885 <coughs> had taken a few boys out and had spent a little time, I think a matter of a week. And then along came uh, a man by the name of Dudley in 1889, I believe it was, uh, somewhere along in there, and he had uh, built on the previous experience and took boys for a little longer period. And then it lay kind of dormant for a while, this matter of camping, and then all of a sudden it commenced to catch on, what it was. For people were commencing to herd themselves together in cities, 
They were living on top of one another in apartment houses. The heritage that boys and girls ought to have, namely the trees and the flowers and the birds and green grass, was slowly being taken away from them by improved city streets and uh, other improvements, quotation marks, that cities <coughs> needed to make. And so, in an effort to restore two kids, a heritage which our forebearers had, namely of growing up in the wilderness, of wrestling with it, of coping with it, of knowing about it, of learning how to live in it, they developed this new thing called camping, <coughs> where a few boys and a dedicated leader went out of the city, they saw the hillside, a wooded area, or a friendly lake, and they had no tents to pitch, perhaps they did. They had no beds, perhaps they did, but most of them didn't. They burrowed a hole in the sand, lay their blankets down on that warm sand, and slept overnight for a period of days. And then their program consisted of the things that they could do about them. Know the trees and the birds, and these kinds of things. A brand new experience of city kids a restoration of life and of some of the freedom that they ought to have had. So Mr. Buell came back from that kind of an experience and he sought <coughs> out some of the men on his committee, for we worked with committees, Do Roger, and Chuck Wise, Wayne Perry, and John Wolf, and myself, and others who are professional YMCA workers. We worked with lay people on committees. They help us <coughs> in immeasurably out of their experience and we sharing ours with them to see things that might happen. And if they're the right kind of things and uh, situations warrant, they usually do happen. And so Mr. Buell sought off two of his friends, one, a man by the name of Wagner in Ann Arbor, Charles Wagner, and another man in Grand Rapids by the name of William H. Gay. And he sat on and talked to them about this new thing called camping. Mr. Wagner, Mr. Gay, our boys of Michigan ought to have this kind of experience. And they listened attentively to him. And they agreed with him. This was in the very, very early spring of 1904. And then one of them said, let us make a journey north sometime this spring. I know where there's a few pretty, very pretty lakes up in the north country. Let us go up and see if we can't find a friendly lake upon which we might start a venture like camping. And so, uh, late in the spring, they came north. They came up by railroad in those days, when we had railroads and when the <coughs> railroad traffic was flourishing. This north country had been cut over by the, by the lumbermen. The great white pine, the great hemlocks, uh, the great red pine were taken out of here. And some of the land up in this particular part of the world, uh, after the lumber had been denuded <coughs> from it, was up for sale for taxes. Just what the taxes might have been on it as cut over land. And so they got off of the train, they tell me down here at Alden, a little town below us here about 12 miles, and they saw this lake. They had known about this lake. And they walked its shoreline. And they walked and they walked. And finally they got up into this area, to the place tonight that we call our old campground. And I hope you'll all find it eventually. It's around the point, and it's where we now have a swimming area for our bush. If you get down there, you'll, you'll recognize it, for there's a big float there tonight, pulled up on shore. <coughs> but this was a very gentle, sloping, uh, grassy area. And here in June, late June of 1904, 24 boys camped for the first time. One of those boys, number 24, is still on our camp committee, Mr. Gordon Kingsbury. And he gets up here annually to attend a committee meeting uh, of the state YMCA camp. 1904. They lived down that area for three years, 1904, 1905, and 1906. And you want to hear the stories they tell. It's a long, long way from camping today, but they dug little holes in the sand for their shoulders and their 
in their seat, nestled themselves down rather uh, friendly like against the sand, and slept that way night after night after night. For the matter of ten days, a long, long time to camp, ten days. Three years they spent down there. The next year their numbers grew a little bit more. In 1906 they grew still more. Then in the uh, late summer of 1906, they commenced to traverse this area here looking for a permanent place where they could perhaps build some tents, put some tents up. And so they settled on what our present campsite is tonight, right up in here, where the boathouse is and the cabins. And come 1907, the first building was built, a great huge lodge. Tonight we call it the boathouse. But back in 1907, that was a great big building for 44 boys. Built out of cement blocks. Interesting thing about that building that I <coughs> like to tell a good many times, there's a cornerstone in it. As you go down this side of the boathouse downstairs, you'll find the log work. We have reserved an open stone that you might see the figure of a bird, outstretched wings. That's the cornerstone. In 1907, Mr. Buell brought into camp a young Chinese student by the name of Wong, W-A-N-G, Wong. He was attending the University of Michigan, as tens of thousands of students, of foreign students have over the years, and as many hundreds do today. I think it's in the 1100, 1200, quite a large number of foreign students. Mr. Wong came as a, as a guest, a uh, Chinese student, new to America, not wanting to know something about a new culture, and so Mr. Buell brought him up, and he lived in camp that summer. And when this boathouse was built, this great log lodge, uh, Mr. Wong, among others, put a little note in the cornerstone. I wish I could be here 150 years or 200 years from now when they tear that cornerstone down. To know what he put there would have been to be interesting to know. But uh, he left his little mark in that cornerstone. And some 35 years later, he left another mark for himself and for his country by being elected by his country to represent it as its ambassador to America, Dr. C.T. Wong. Under the influence of Mr. Buell, this man had become a part of a great international figure. And I'm told that uh, not too many years ago, upon the occasion of one of Mr. Wong's, Dr. Wong's visit, to Ann Arbor, that somebody had found on the grave of Mr. Buell in the Ann Arbor Cemetery a little faded bouquet of flowers with a little card, Dr. C.T. Wong, long after Mr. Buell had died. Well, this big building in 1907 was the first building built here. Great long great <coughs> concrete building, big one. Then there followed very shortly thereafter a couple, three tents. Uh, right behind the uh, little ways along where the present cabin row is now. And that grew in later years to about 16 tents. And uh, some of the crudest bunks that you could imagine. For a long time there were nothing more than, than just a pile of straw sewed in on the, under the tent roof. And every boy grabbed a handful of straw for himself and put his blankets over it. And this was his bunk for years. I don't know what they did about hay fever in those days. I guess they didn't have it. But uh, we certainly would be, uh, we certainly would have a lot of difficulty today in that kind of a setting. And they lived that way for years, summer after summer, with their blankets just thrown over a pile of straw, each boy having his own separate pile. And then later on there came some wood floors and some makeshift bunks. And I remember having slept on one of those bunks when I first came here in 1928. They were built out of two by sixes with a piece of canvas uh, in between them that sagged more than some of our present bunks do. But they had no mattresses on them. And I think one of the coldest nights I ever spent in my life was a late September night up here in 1928 on one of those bunks. Bitter cold. Bitter, bitter cold. <coughs> in 1922, the uh, trading post or the present camp office down here where we kind of hold forth in the summer was built. 1922. That was built out of cement block. And at about the same time, a leader's lodge, then it was, it was a, a housing unit, was built up uh, 
at the far end of the campground, and today we call it the Leader's Lodge. It was built about the same time. It has served many usages since that time. Its philosophy has never been clear-cut, for it's been a lodge, nature cabin, nurses' quarters, health center, little giant's cabin, leader's cabin. It served all those purposes now through the years. In 1911, I believe it was, the first dining hall was built. Quite a ramshackle affair right on this very site. And it lasted for a matter of about uh, 16 years, and another one was built. A little more substantial, but not much more so. And then in 1931, uh, uh, 1930, a man by the name of Bondright, whom some of you have met, 1929, I should back up, uh, Mr. Bondright, who had been a camper here in 1912, 13, and 14, and had gained such a wonderful experience as some of you fellows will get, and so many, many thousands have gotten, having made some money uh, as a young man of 30, <coughs> turned around and gave to this camp, gave to the committee, the staggering sum of $50,000 in 1928. And his brother in 1928, that's a lot of greenbacks. $50,000 and said, put this camp up to real good standing. And the camp committee went to work. For that $50,000, uh, the camp committee built 12 log cabins, all identical. Cabins 1 through 8, 9 through 12. Log cabins open to the weather as you sleep in them tonight, but most substantial, and we think quite fitting to a camp like ours. For that $50,000, we built that uh, uh, cement dock. And almost every summer, some old timer comes back and he looks wistfully at that dock. He says, I helped build it. For it was a high white crowd that did it back in 1928. Working in shifts of two hours on and four hours off, they worked 48 consecutive hours with a cement mixer, never stopping. Mixing it, wheeling it, dumping it, wheeling it, mixing it, dumping it, until lunch. You can't stop at a job like that. They had to complete it. And they worked for 48 straight hours in putting that dock in. And since 1928, that dock has stood there, uh, gathering the sand each year a little bit, until today we have not only a very substantial dock that's needing some repair, still there, however, but we have a very wonderful expanse of sand. The dock having stopped the sand in its washing process. And we have on this side the lake, from uh, <coughs> the end of the lake clear to Eastport, about the only sandy beach on the lake, on this lake side. The south end of the lake, the north end of the lake have sand. We have about the only sandy beach here due to the, due to the dock. For that $50,000, we built three very fine cement tennis courts. And gentlemen, those courts have been in there since 1928. That's for their 40 years. And they are almost as good as the day they were poor. Unusually fine construction. For that $50,000, we built about a quarter of a mile of breakwater starting right at the base of the old lodge and running way up past the leader's cabin to keep the erosion from tearing away the bank. And it has succeeded, the breakwater has succeeded far beyond our expectations. We have not been washed away due to that wonderful breakwater. With the rest of that $50,000, the big lodge upon the hill was built, Bond Bright Lodge. Built of logs that were native to this part of the country, built by craftsmen, who lived in this area, built for the great sum in those days of $19,000. Today that log lodge is evaluated for replacement purposes at 90% of its evaluation, and they judge it would cost $70,000 to rebuild it. $70,000 <coughs> to rebuild Von Bright Lodge. All that with a $50,000 gift back in 1928, 29, and 30. The health center uh, was built, and that's right up here on top of the hill after we'd served its purpose down the far north end of the campground. We built a new one because we had to. The camp was expanding in number. I think we got up to 80 boys. And uh, so we built a new health center. And tonight it's right up here at the top of the hill, uh, built in 1935. Uh, in 1936, the Department of Health came in here and said, uh, is this your dining hall? We said, yes. And all we had in 1936 was a roof, 
and post every little ways along to hold the roof up. Uh, beams across it, much like this. They said, you've got to screen this dining hall. New regulation. Flies are coming around. Mosquitoes are coming around. You've got to screen it. And we looked at it and said, how in heavens can we screen this old barn? For here it stood open to the weather. No sides on it, just posts up, reeling all the way around. We fed the red squirrels from, the, from our table on the rail. They sat there and ate toast while we did. The yellow jackets came in in droves. And we had, uh, in those days, gel and peanut butter like we have today. And you needed to watch every mouthful you took, lest you, put a, yes, you get a yellow jacket in your mouth. They were just that thick. And we could understand why we needed to screen. And so we said to the camp committee, this is, this is useless to screen this, this old barn. Uh, cement was breaking up. Uh, you couldn't screen it. There were just, it couldn't be done. It just couldn't be done. So the committee said, let's tear it down. This was in the early spring of 1936. And I thought, how are we going to have a camp without a dining hall? And I think it was in March, a committee of old time camp people who've been alumnus here, alumni, uh, got together and said, let's send out a letter. And they sent out a letter, and in a week's time, $15,600 came in, and they built this dining hall, as it is tonight, for $15,600. Built it and equipped it. Such is the, uh, is the uh, value of uh, friends. In 1951, <coughs> let me back up a little bit, in about 1939, cabin 13 was built. My dad built that cabin. Bless his heart. I wish Dad could be here tonight to know that you're here and enjoy it. My dad's a very old man, still alive, he and mother, and uh, I expect to see him within the next couple of weeks. Thank God. Built that little giant cabin, and we used that cabin during the war years for seven and eight year old boys whose fathers and mothers were in military service, some way, either in defense work or the fathers uh, in the military forces. And so we took a lot of these little guys, these little seven-year-olds, and eight-year-olds, and we had a wonderful time with them. And the little, and the leader's cabin back in those days, the nurse's cabin, uh, was converted into a similar housing unit for these little guys. And we had a man and his wife in charge of the little giants, we called them. They were tremendous to work with. And we felt we were serving a real need while dad and mother were giving their time and services to the to the uh, defense of our country. We lived in those days in a little, tire, a little shack up on the hill, a war housing unit, a little kind of a little uh, pasteboard box, and the roof leaked and the squirrels chewed through the sides. And it got rather dilapidated, so the camp committee said, got to build a new home for the camp director. And so they built Mrs. Dury and myself a very lovely cabin out back here, and two apartments up on the hill to take care of, of married housing, married counselors who we wanted to have come back to camp with us. Otherwise, we couldn't take them. This is 1951. And again, the same kind of an appeal went out. Need to build a camp director's cottage. Need to build a couple of, uh, of units for uh, married counselors so that we can have a, a, an adequate staff in camp. And no time again, $15,500 came in. And these three buildings were built. Now that takes care of most of the, of the physical structure of the, uh, of the uh, camp. The old tennis courts up here were built way back in the early 20s out of, uh, out of uh, asphalt. They've been resurfaced in the last couple of years and they're very usable again <coughs> to serve a, a multitude of purposes. Uh, now the real reason behind this camp as Mr. Buell told it to us, there were three, three reasons. First of all, he and the committee were anxious to give the boys of camp, a, the boys of Michigan, a camping experience. Bear that in mind, a camping experience. 1904, this is the father of all the camps in Michigan, so far as we know now. There have been two or three that started before 1904, 04, but this is the oldest camp on the same site. Uh, and so this camp, this is his 60th year. Second thing that Mr. Buell uh, wanted to, this camp to serve, not only the boys of Michigan for a camping experience, 
but he wanted it to be a leadership training establishment. Leadership training. And we've never deviated one bit from that purpose way back in 1904. For here we are tonight, leadership development. And the regular camp that we have through the summer, we think in terms of leadership. <coughs> and we're growing them. Two-thirds of the staff we have, we've grown. Leadership. And so here was a second reason. And the third reason Mr. Buell had in mind is what vision this man had. He hoped that somehow or other it could, in some way, serve as an international stimulus. In some way. And so Dr. Wong came. And there's been a procession of men and women since that day, way back in 1907. International understanding, international brotherhood, call it what you will, world service. It has all these facets. And we've not deviated one bit from all three purposes. All three purposes. And I hope to God this camp never does deviate from the three purposes for which it was founded. Now let's tell you a little bit more about it, because the hour draws late. Uh, we talked about the physical facilities. This doesn't make a camp by no means. The thing that makes a camp is its leadership. For I've often said that a, a good leader could take a bunch of boys out on a desert, a good leader, and have a tremendous program, a good leader. And with all the facilities we have, we still think in terms of a high-grade, devoted, dedicated leadership for this camp. And so we're here tonight for that very purpose. You fellows are going to be leaders. You're leaders now in your community. You represent your high Y club. You represent your school in many ways, not only in high Y work, but on other kinds of groups and other kinds of groupings. You represent your community. You're leaders. You're going to be leaders more so in the years that lie ahead. And we'll talk to that. We'll talk about that more later on. But leadership is 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 all important. Now a little bit about the other aspects of this camp. Uh, because things have come hard here, <coughs> equipment and so forth, we say to all of you, use it, use it fully, but do not misuse it, please. Do not misuse it. People have given it to us, a good bit of it. A lot of it uh, we've had to save money to buy. And when you buy a truck or when you buy a sailboat like we got there tonight, that represents a lot of hard work on the part of a lot of people to save that we might be able to buy those kinds of things. When Mr. Buell was living, and he lived, uh, he lived until 1936, I believe it was, uh, he, was a, he was an ardent conservationist. And he, in the years after his retirement in 1922, he was permitted to live in the camp farmhouse down here at the south end of the, he and his wife, of the property. And in those years from 1922 until his death, Mr. Buell spent his seasons, particularly the springtime, planting trees. Planting trees, trimming trees, doing everything that's required to make trees grow. And I think the number that he planted during the days uh, he was living and active is well over 200,000. All these trees you see up in here in the main have been planted, stuck into the ground one at a time. And if you've ever planted trees, uh, and I don't mean just one, but you planted them by the day, it's a back-breaking job. It's hard, hard work. One at a time, planted them by hand. Uh, the years since his death, uh, we have just been taking care of them, except we plant maybe 500 or 1,000 each year just to take care of those that die or get blown over or they get chewed up by the mice or the rabbits during the winter time. We just try to plant enough to, to replenish those that die out. For we're growing up into a, form, into a forest primeval. And I pray God that nobody takes them off unless they die naturally. This is a philosophy that I have, and I, I quarrel with lots of people about it, but I have it nevertheless. So Mr. Buell planted trees by the thousands, and there are, there are, uh, they are uh, a testimony tonight to, to him, and to the vision this man had that boys and trees ought to grow up together. He wrote that once upon a time. Uh, boys and trees ought to grow up together. They have so much in common. They have so much in common. And so we're very zealous about the trees. 
Some boys are rather thoughtless and they carve the white virtues, tear off the bark, and disfigure them for their natural life. And we're sorry about that, but most boys uh, have treated them with, uh, with, with due respect and the high regard, and we have. Today we have probably as beautiful a campsite because of its trees as there is in this world. <coughs> Another feature that we are, we are continually working on is erosion. <coughs> and when you think of the number of feet that travel this campground in the summer, the number of steps that get taken, every step does something to the land, every step does something to the land, it just jars a couple more grains of sand loose, which is apt to be washed. We have a real problem in erosion. And so when we say, please keep to the main path, and not the shortest place down the bank, we say that because when you come down the bank, other than by path, you open up an area to erosion. And this is tremendously difficult to fight, tremendously difficult to cope with. So we would make this plea to you tonight, fellas, to come down the banks by the three or four or five main pathways down. I'd like to say just a word or two about this lake, upon whose shores this camp has been placed here for some 60 years. This is a tremendously wonderful lake. I live beside it now for 36 years. Uh, it's never the same any second. Ugly moods, friendly moods, beautiful, gray, drab, but a tremendous body of water. Glacial, of course, as you people would know. Glacial, we find all over the shores here the Petoskey Stone, which is brought in here by the glaciers, in which we gather and polish into such beautiful jewelry. Occasionally we'll find a uh, brachiopod. Once in a great while we'll find a trilobite, which says that 250 million years ago the glacier left him here on these shores. The trilobite, 250 million years ago. That's quite a long time. This lake is about 18 miles long. It runs pretty nar largely north and south. We were at about the shortest distance across, right across from the boathouse, which is about a mile and a quarter across. And down here by Alden, it's its greatest width, is about two and a half miles wide. It's a long, narrow <coughs> lake, which says something from the standpoint of, uh, of storms. It was formerly called Torchlight Lake, called that by the Indians, because they used to spear whitefish by torchlight. And in the fall of the year, in early October, uh, the sheriff of this county and some others asked for permission to come onto our ground that they might be down to the point to the old campground, if you please, and launch a boat and steer whitefish by lantern light, by flashlight, by gas torch. But back in the old days, it was called Torchlight Lake because of the spearing carried on by the Indians. Then it was, then it was cut out at Old Torch, and uh, there are lots of people who still call it Old Torch, and we just call it Torch. It's a, as I say, it's a tremendously beautiful lake. The uh, National Geographic, as I understand it, and I have not been unable to find it, has said once upon a time that it was the third most beautiful lake in the world. And then it went on to say that two lakes in Switzerland were the most beautiful, but that the rating or the appraisal was given by some Swiss uh, uh, geologists, so uh, perhaps they might have been a bit prejudiced. We care not what the rating is by anybody. We just simply say that it's a tremendously beautiful body of water. It's a deep lake. It's a deep lake. It's uh, down through the center. It'll average right around 270 feet. There have been places found where it's around 340. Uh, divers have gone down outside of opposite Alden to a depth of 288 feet. Divers have gone down. A group from Detroit did it a couple of winters ago. So it's a long, Rather narrow, tremendously deep lake. You know, when we say to you fellows, uh, you ought to stay in kind of close to shore, don't get off too far, or when we say that uh, we've taken the sailboats in because we have such a short time here, we haven't got time to test you in your sailing ability, we think it's safest that you stay in out of the sailboats. For I have seen this very summer, <coughs> three flash storms come up, Lou, have we, that I wouldn't have wanted to have been out the lake a hundred yards in a sailboat. I wouldn't have wanted to have been out there or had anybody else out there in a sailboat or any other kind of a craft for that matter because of the very, very high winds and the tremendously high winds. 
And you know it isn't the fact that you're a good swimmer. You can boast about your swimming ability. But when you get overturned out in that lake, when the water temperature drops down to 56 and 58, as it does in a, in a blow, your swimming ability is pretty nil. And uh, the adage to hang to your craft, of course, is the best. But you get some none that you let go. And, uh, and that's happened to far too many people on this lake. And when they let go, they let go for the last time, and nobody finds you because this lake doesn't give up its dead. I know of eight instances on this lake that, uh, that people have drowned or gone down, and they've never come back. For their body sinks, and the lake is so cold, so cold down underneath that there's no opportunity to form body gases that brings the body to the surface. If it were warm, there would, there would incur inside body gases that would bloat it and cause it to rise. Not so. It stays down. Oh, matter of about seven years ago, four men in a boat, in a motorboat, down on the south end of the lake, opposite Alden, all lost their lives. One of them, the mayor of Cincinnati. Remember that night because we were out helping to find them. And of course, to no avail. So when we tell you about sailing kind of close, uh, because of the dangers that this lake holds, and it's a tremendously friendly lake. We, we have been all over it on days that are calm and peaceful and bright. We've canoed its length. We've gone after kids in the middle of the night, clear over around the points. It's a friendly lake, but it can also be a very terrifying lake. And we treat it uh, in that angle so that we remain safe. There are some very interesting legends that have grown up around the lake. I think I'll close with one of these, <coughs> or two or three of them. Because, uh, like all uh, lakes, there are legends, and like all camp or traditions, uh, one of the stories that they tell is that there's a big boiling spring right about in this direction from us, what we call Three Pine. Three Pine Point. It's a point projecting out in the lake. Once upon a time, many years ago, there were three distinct pine trees growing there. Now the foliage has grown in, so you don't see them any longer. But the old legend is that there's a great boiling spring over there. And when the day is just right, when it's nice and calm and you're in the exact right spot, you will find the water bubbling up as much as a foot over the surface of the lake, just a big bubbling spring. Nobody's been able to find it. Nobody can tell just where it is. George says so, and who said to George? Oh, Pete told George. And it goes way on back, just a series of legends. <coughs> There's another legend that there, this lake has no bottom to it in places. No bomb, have been able to find it. Sounds have gone down and down and down. Well, that's legend. I don't know whether the people that took the, uh, the survey a good many years ago have, would, would substantiate that or not. There's another legend that this lake connects with, uh, with this arm of Traverse Bay over here by an underground passage. Underground. The people have been known to, to, to come through it in, uh, in uh, uh, masks and so forth. Uh, not so. It couldn't. We haven't known of anybody that ever knew about where it was or anything else. And by the way, it's only about a half mile across from the, uh, right up here, from uh, down through Torch River and across to the big lake. But the prize legend of all is the one that I like to tell the most. Uh, you know, I mentioned that this lake doesn't give up, it's dead. When they get down so deep, they're down there. They don't come up. Boise holds them down, and the Boise holds them up, and they're suspended part way down. The this, this legend is this. Many years ago, a, a log sled with a driver and a pair of four horses were coming across the lake with a huge load of logs on the ice. And here he sat on top of his logs with his two teams on ahead of him. And, and by the way, this lake does freeze over uh, at times just tremendously hard. And again, I've seen this lake not frozen over a bit. Last year, it froze a little tiny bit. Two years ago, it didn't freeze a bit across it. And I have cut ice on the, off of this lake uh, at 30 below zero, and the ice was two feet cubed, two by two by two, weighing 250 pounds apiece. And we used to store it in an old ice house out back and put it in, in a nice chest off overneath. Those are the, those are the happy days. Um, well, the one of this legend, he was starting across the lake with his teams, and the ice gave way, and he sunk, of course, by sheer weight. And uh, there are people who say that 
if you will go to a certain spot, roll over there on a good calm day, you can look down and here, 50 feet down about, on a good clear day, you can see him still holding his reins of his four horses, still sitting on top of his logs, of his load of logs, with his cap pulled down around his ears. Logs intact behind on the sled is the teamster who has never returned. There he sits in the happy purgatory, as one would call it, suspended 50 feet down under the surface of the water. There's some very interesting legends about this camp. I'm going to close with one or two of them. Each for all and all for each is the model of this camp. Uh, taken from a, an Indian legend, by the way, this camp is named after an <coughs> Indian, uh, a legendary Indian. Mr. Buell knew a man by the name of Hathaway, who was a neighbor of his in Ann Arbor. Mr. Hathaway had heard a story written by and told by Schoolcraft, who was an Indian historian from the Upper Peninsula, about this legendary Indian that roamed around among the tribes, trying to bring them together into, a, into an era of peace. This was our first League of Nations, if you wish, maybe our first United Nations effort way back in those days of Indian law. And uh, he succeeded, did this Indian. And uh, Mr. Schoolcraft told the story to Mr. Longfellow, and Mr. Longfellow wrote he Mr. Schoolcraft told the same story to Mr. Hathaway, and Mr. Hathaway wrote he went. And so the same legendary Indian was interpreted by two writers in almost the same way, but giving them just a little different twist in the way of a name. Each for all and all for each is enumerated and, and uh, written about two or three times in Mr. Hathaway's book. And so we have that very wonderful model, and we make an honest effort to live up to it. We have two or three interesting little traditions. Another one is that when you leave the leader's cabin up at the north end of the campground, you know, tradition just kind of grow up and somebody mentions another year and they mention all, they pass along to some other people for another year. When you leave the leader's cabin up there to go to a worship service with the council ring, there's no talking. You just kind of walk along with your thoughts. And uh, many times there are long thoughts. I think one of the nicest traditions I know concerned itself with a bunch of boys who went down to play ball one day down to the alfalfa field down here, which was then a ball diamond. And uh, <coughs> on the way back, they rushed into camp as they usually did, just before lunchtime. And in those days, we could drink out of this little spring, right out here that runs under our kitchen. Because the water was free from pollution, Civilization had not impinged too much on us, and we could drink from that spring. And the first boy rushed in there, and there was a tin can hanging on a stick. And he picked it up, and he drew a can of water, and he was about to drink when the second fellow pulled in. And something flashed through his mind, and he passed the cup along to the second man. And as he received the cup, the third man and the fourth man come on. And before long, 21 had come. And the man to get the first drink was the 21st man. And that's the kind of the spirit of this camp you're in tonight. Kind of the spirit of it. We help one another. We consider one another. And it's one of the reasons that make it, along with so many of our other YMCA camps in Michigan, such a tremendous experience for boys. <coughs> because here is a little bit of paradise that we can... Uh, settle ourselves into for such a short time, too short, before getting back again to the rush that is the city. And such is the story of Hewitt. Hey,